nights, special night, very special. How many years? 31 years, Hall of Fame, Cerebral, CPAS. Round of applause, 31 years. That's amazing. That's amazing. Celebration. I'm so pleased to be here, share these with you, and my friends, my good friends, welcome again. With that, we begin a program. We have a special night, special program. First of all, please, visiting committee, please stand up. VC, stand up, please. Thank you so much, visiting committee. Yay! Good job, yes. The faculty and staff of the college, please stand up. CPAS, faculty and staff. Yay! Good job, yes. Retirees, all CPAS retired faculty, stand up please. And staff, and staff, retired. Yay! Special night. Hey, students here, CPAS students, stand up. If you'd like to be a student, stand up. <laughs> Previous Hall of Fame inductees, CPAS, Previous Hall of Fame inductees, stand up. Yay! Yeah, stand up. We're proud of you, what you've done. Please welcome Provost Mark Gavin to the podium, please. Mark Gavin. Special one, Provost. Hey, Mark. Thank you, sir. You good? Thank you. You're there, all right. And I, I, I think, thank you, Dean Brooks. I think he said it at the end, but associate provost. Um, I think the provost would have a few words if she thought I was no, taking her no. position. Yes, no, no. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, I will keep my brief, uh, my comments brief, and that's not to in indicate the, uh, it's not indicative of the importance of this event. It's simply we have m more interesting and important people to hear from. Uh, nonetheless, I do want to offer a heartfelt welcome. Um, and congratulations to our inductees and honorees for tonight. Um, West Virginia is really positioned now and, and always has been, but is especially angling to make its mark in the world. Um, through our faculty, through our staff, through our current students, and certainly through our alumni, we're striving to really impact the world around us. And I'm really excited because tonight's honorees and inductees provide a great example of how we can achieve that. Um, and it's important for that reason amongst many others. Um, even if in some small way, we as West Virginia University and then also the College of Physical Activity and Sports Sciences um, are facilitating and supporting the work of the others, uh, of those who we're honoring and, and inducting tonight. Um, so tonight we honor six individuals, and that includes five alumni, as well as one former faculty member. Um, they are diverse in their backgrounds, and they're diverse in their fields of endeavor. And this is not meant to capture all of it, and we're going to hear more about each of them in some detail in a little bit, which I'm really excited about. But if we take the six of them together collectively, their good work has impacted the fields of education. That includes primary, secondary, and higher. It includes academics, it includes science and research, it includes health, it includes business and industry, it includes spiritual life, it includes sports, up to and including the Olympic arena, and also the military. And on that ladder, um, and this is not meant to take away from any of the other five honorees and inductees, but uh, David Taylor, I do want to recognize you and thank you for your service to our country. While diverse in their endeavors, they share something in common in that they have made an indelible difference in the world and people around them, each in their own way. Your accomplishments not only make the world around us a better place, but West Virginia generally and the College of Physical Activity and Sports Sciences specifically benefit both directly and indirectly through and from your good work. What you have done enhances the value and reputation of the West Virginia University and the college's name and legacy. Equally of value, you each provide a model of a life of impact and meaning 
and offer an example to aspire to for those of us who are and should be watching, not the least of which are our current students. You show us what is possible through preparation, hard work, and dedication. On behalf of all of West Virginia University and all of CPAS stakeholders, including faculty, staff, and students, whether past, current, or future, we thank you for offering up these examples that are worthy of such recognition. Again, I'm excited to hear from each of you, and congratulations. This is a well-deserved honor. Well, your name's called, please stand. Tracy, show day though. Tracy, stay in, please. Come on, come on. Thank you, ma'am. Dave Taylor. Yay. Deborah Thorpe. Deborah Thorpe. Richard Tucci. Take down. Got it right here. David Deswatowski. Close, David. Close. Close. Okay. Eddie Hawkins. Dr. Hawkins. Please try on the polls. This year's class, Faye Yeah, thank you, please. Herb, please stand up. Epitals, come here, Herb. Please. You get to say hello to the committee. He does. Yes, sir. I have a small task, but very important one. I, I want to introduce the uh, Hall of Fame committee, the one that's put all the tireless energy and, and time into selecting these nominees. Uh, they, they've collected the information, they've gathered it, they've reviewed it, they've read it, and then once again, I think we have a very strong class, uh, and I'm hoping that we can continue to, to make this happen. Kathy, will you stand up? Kathy Likovich is the uh, chair of the Hall of Fame committee. Uh, once again, she's the one that gets this organized in order to make sure that the, the selection is, is done the way that we've set the guidelines. Les Pullman is not here. He's the co-chair. I do need to tell you why he's not here. His mother is coming from England to celebrate her 98th birthday. So I had to excuse him from, from coming. So, uh, and then Bill Alsop, Bill, raise your hand wherever you are. I, know, I just saw you. And then Paul Grace in the back is the other one. So once again, give them a nice round of applause for all their hard work. And as I said, Kathy is the chair. I'm gonna bring Kathy up now to get this started. Good evening, everyone. On behalf of the Hall of Fame committee, I would like to extend a warm welcome all right, to our four inductees, their families, friends, and colleagues. This evening, we are gathered to celebrate each inductee into the College of Physical Activity and Sports Science Hall of Fame. Their accomplishments, achievements, and professional success in their respective disciplines epitomizes what it means to be a graduate of West Virginia University. My colleague, Dr. Herb Amato, has previously introduced members of the Hall of Fame Committee. I extend my sincere appreciation to each of them for their dedication and professionalism in the selection of this year's inductees. In addition, I would also like to thank Kim Camion, all right, for her valuable assistance and computer expertise during the past year. She was an integral part of the Hall of Fame committee. Each of these four inductees began their professional journey within the walls of this institution. They have obtained outstanding careers worthy of our recognition. The Hall of Fame committee welcomes each of you back home to Almost Heaven, West Virginia, where your journey first began. Our first inductee is Tracy Shoenadel. Tracy earned her undergraduate and graduate degrees in physical education and sport administration from this institution. During her career, Tracy was vice president, executive director of the Cantor Media ESPN Sports Poll in New York City. As vice president, Tracy has worked with top companies in sponsorship, along with several leagues such as Sprint Nextel, Anheuser-Busch, the National Football League, 
Major League Baseball, NBA, and the NCAA. Her teaching experiences at institutions of higher education are extensive. She has taught graduate sport marketing research courses and has been an adjunct professor at the University of Richmond Robin School of Business in Virginia, the University of Connecticut, and the Tisch School of Hospitality, Tourism, and Sport Management at New York University. Tracy's management style has led to her position as Executive Director, McCormick Center for Sport Research and Education at the Eisenberg School of Management at the University of Massachusetts. Presently, Tracy is a Senior Vice President, SMG Insight, located in New York City. In addition to her leadership roles, Tracy has written numerous grants and contracts that has produced $800,000 in revenue. She has also made multiple presentations on topics regarding sponsorship and marketing to the Red Bull, Under Armour, Major League Soccer, and Pepsi. Introducing Tracy this evening is Dr. Dallas Branch. Kathy hasn't left me much to say. <clears throat> when I was asked to uh, introduce Tracy to you tonight, I started getting emails and a letter from the dean, and they all made a point of saying, you've got three minutes to introduce Tracy to the group. And I've got one thing to say about that. Not. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'll do my best. This is what we know about Tracy Shoenadel, somebody that I have a special place in my heart for. She's competent and accomplished professionally, has over 26 years in the sports sponsorship and advertising industries. She's had these titles, which tells you something about her drive and determination and her competence. Senior Vice President and Managing Director of Sports, North America. Vice President of the U.S. Office for Sports Intelligence. Executive Director of the ESPN Sports Poll. So we know she's competent. She can teach. She's been an adjunct professor and, a, and the Director of the Sports Sponsorship Research Center at UMass Amherst. She was an adjunct professor of sport management, as you heard earlier, from NYU, University of Connecticut, and Richmond University. So we know she can teach. She also taught a class or two for us here at WVU, not only in our college, but in the College of Business. She can serve, create, and build. She worked nine years for the WVU football office in recruiting and eligibility. Some have said that she signed Don Nealon's name more times than he did in those nine years. <laughs> she was the president of the School of Physical Education's Undergraduate Student Club, and she was the founding managing editor of a journal called the Sport Marketing Quarterly that I started way back when in 1992. It's an academic journal that's become the, uh, the most widely read sport marketing journal in the field. It's been subscribed to in 30 some countries worldwide. And Tracy has also served as the College of Physical Activity and Sports Sciences visiting committee member. But the, her work on the sport marketing quarterly was particularly touching and helpful and strategic in my development. So I will certainly always thank her for that. She can give. She was the Mountaineer Athletic Club, or the MAX, Northeast Regional Development Representative <clears throat> in 1980, excuse me, in 2008, 
She and her spouse, Laura Boyd, Boyd were inducted into the Woodburn Circle Society. That's a, a group at WVU here who have given $100,000 or more to WVU and its affiliated organizations. Those are the things that we know about Tracy. Here's some things you don't know about Tracy. It's been said that those under her direction are amazed at the connections she has developed in the sports sponsorship world. People she works with can't bring up a person in the industry that she doesn't know. And she knows and is respected by everyone in the industry. She's a great leader of people. She's unassuming, and that's her nature. She listens well, but she's also not afraid to take risk. She's been characterized as a fixer. She never tries to be anybody other than who she is. She's true to herself, and she doesn't deceive others. She's also been said to be a great strategic player. She's, it's like she's playing chess with others, with them e not even knowing that she's playing. And then she makes a move, and the game is over. Checkmate. She's won. She's never lost sight of the benefits she has derived from any job she's ever had. She's never been happier, I understand, in doing what she's doing right now at the present time. One of her personal strengths and commitments is the fact that she ensures that WVU is seen in a positive light in everything she does. She lives and breathes West Virginia. She gave the ESPN Sports Poll da database that we've heard about which is arguably the largest and most widely used sport fan database in the world. Listen to the size of this. 600,000 plus respondents across the country, over 600 variables. Think about the size of that database, those of you who do research. She gave this database to the Graduate Sport Management Program at WVU in 2002 so that we could teach sports sponsorship and sport marketing with that database. We could do research and we could consult with sports organizations all over the country as a hands-on class that was unique in the country, actually in the world. No one did anything like this. So we were the only program nationally who taught this course and provided marketing and sponsorship analysis over 14 years to some of the 12 professional sports organizations that we dealt with. The Washington Capitals, NHL Club, we did it for them twice. Charlotte Hornets, Charlotte Bobcats, Indiana Pacers, Memphis Grizzlies, Pittsburgh Pirates twice, Washington Wizards, the Atlanta Hawks, and the Atlanta Thrashers. So we did all this with her help and she was asked by many other programs to give it to them too. And she said, only WVU is going to get this. When she left in 1992, she joined her spouse Laura in Richmond, who basically said it's the only time that they have been together where Laura had made more money than Tracy. And that was because Tracy didn't have a job. Her dad, George, sitting right over here, always wanted her to become a nurse. So in the words of Paul Harvey, now you know the rest of the story. For these and many other reasons, I thank her for her friendship, her attention and commitment to all of us at WVU, and especially for her help in me becoming the teacher I was and the person that I've become. I will always love her for that. So thank you, Tracy, and congratulations.
Thank you, everyone. Where's the car? Ours broke down on the way here, so we need a new one. So uh, just one of the guests here. Um, first off, I'd like to start off by thanking the other honorees tonight. Um, David, Deborah, Richard, David, and Andrew, also on the Outstanding in the Service Awards. Briefly, I want to just say my love affair with West Virginia University. I can actually give you the date. It was October 8th. Um, 1974. I was in fourth grade, uh, living in LaVale, Maryland, and my parents decided that, uh, well, the Pride of West Virginia was coming over to perform at halftime at the Allegheny High School uh, and decided that we were going to host six kids from the band. By the time they left, I had worn every one of their, their bobs, ha bobby hats, their, their uniforms and everything, and when I saw that band run out there, uh, at halftime, I fell in love with West Virginia right there. But to get to where I am today, it really is the passion of the drive that I have in my industry and in what I do every day and the way I live my life. It is a combination of my education and my family. Uh, I'd like to just start off with education. From the time that I walked in, Dean Brooks. Yes, ma'am. Yes, Dr. Bonneman. And I had... I, my mother away from home, Dor Doris Dorenzi, yes. uh, that is no longer with us, and Dr. Hawkins, Dr. Wiggins, Dr. Bonneman, uh, all a big part of my life. And Joanne Pollock, it's so good to see you, uh, pointing me in the right direction every day. But then uh, Dr. Carson also, I cannot forget Dr. Carson, because it was both undergrad and graduate school that you got me through. But then grad school, it came to a family that was also very special, um, uh, Dr. Alsop, Dr. Branch, Marie, Janine, uh, Rammer, up there. Um, that started in 87, and it's been a marriage and a match. I cannot thank you enough for all that, that you have supported me in my career. And uh, picked me up, dusted me off, told me to get back out there, and uh, not to complain. And then finally, Yes, I can sign Don Nealon's name better than anyone else. I do have his checkbook if you still like, uh, <laughs> if, if anybody wants it. Um, but also Coach Donnie Young, they were wonderful. Uh, those poor college days and early days, I have to thank Coach Nealon because he had a free pass to lunch in every restaurant in Morgantown and he let me use it quite a bit. So, And then there's my family. My mom and dad who were over here, I, I'm, I'm truly reflective and I'm, I'm, both of you are so much a part of me every day. My sister Renee and her lovely daughter, my, my niece Rachel. My sister Kim and her children, Taylor and Andrew and Alyssa and Rowan. And, and then from on my in-law side, I have just been so blessed uh, with the Scott Boyd family, Debbie. Uh, um, I, uh, Where's Ryan? Did you, he leave? Oh, there he is. Like, I was like, wait, I was going for the Ryan next, and then Anita and Kyle and Heather, and, and where's Madison? What do you guys do with her? There she is over there. So, uh, and if I forgot anybody, please let me know. And Sean, Dave, and Steve, and Debbie, and uh, everybody. Kim, uh, my sister Kim over there. So, again, and Scott. I said the Scott Boyd family, so. And then David Boyd, too. Um, but finally, I will have to say that I have two loves in my life, and that is West Virginia University, and the most importantly, the love of my life, and that's Laura Boyd. What you have done and, and to support me has been amazing since the day we met on this campus. And thank God you taught special ed, so you got a job wherever we went. Yes. And, uh, and supported us in the early days. I cannot thank you enough, and also being good at your talent that you could get a job wherever I got my next job. And, uh, and so forth. So I would be remiss without telling you that I couldn't live without West Virginia in my life. I'm thankful that it's not Virginia Tech or Pitt, Hale West. Our second inductee is David Taylor. 
He received his undergraduate degree in athletic training from this institution. He entered the United States Army in 1997 and retired as a lieutenant colonel in 2017. David's distinguished military career was spent in Special Operations Forces, the Army Rangers, and the Joint Special Operations Command. He was deployed in combat eight times to Iraq and Afghanistan, where he earned four Bronze Star Medals for his valor in Iraqi freedom to liberate Iraq, and also for exceptional meritorious achievement as an operations officer and commander in support of Operation Enduring Freedom. In addition to David's outstanding success as a battalion air operations officer, a Ranger Company commander, and an executive officer of the 2nd Ranger Battalion, Lieutenant Colonel David Taylor served as subject matter expert for counterterrorism, operations to the Pentagon, and senior leadership of the Department of Defense for the Joint Special Operations Command. He led staffing, planning, and organization of all command initiatives through the Pentagon, leading to presidential approval of over 50 successful, highly sensitive military operations. In his remarkable military career and the many years he has served in various locations within the United States and throughout the world, David states, and I quote, his most honorable and humbling experience was his final assignment as commander within the famed Old Guard where his unit was responsible for laying falling heroes to rest in Arlington National Cemetery. In retirement from the United States Army, David is the Director of Leadership and Business Operations at LDR Investment Group, located in Washington, D.C. He volunteers his time with Team Rubicon, which is a disaster response organization, and serves as an ambassador to Objective Zero City, which focuses on decreasing veteran suicides. Introducing Lieutenant Colonel David Taylor is Vince Stilger. Good evening, everyone, and uh, congratulations to all the award recipients tonight. Um, truly deserving of what you've accomplished while you were here and beyond. It's my distinct pleasure to be able to introduce to you um, one of my former students and a friend, David Taylor. Dave graduated from WVU in 97 with a degree in physical education and athletic training. He was also a distinguished military graduate from the ROTC program. Even though David's undergraduate academic preparation was as an athletic trainer, his career calling over the next 20 years was with the United States Army. David spent most of his military career as an Army Ranger and uh, within special operations. He was stationed in such places as Fort Campbell, Kentucky, Fort Benning, Georgia, Joint Base Lewis McCord in the state of Washington, and several other spots in between. United States Army recognized Dave's potential. As he started out as a rifle platoon leader, eventually assumed leadership roles as a company commander, a battalion air operations officer, a ranger company commander, operations officer, and an executive officer. And in his role as an executive officer, he led a task force of over a thousand special operations forces into Afghanistan in which he targeted certain Taliban and Al-Qaeda leadership. Through his military tenure, David deployed to Iraq and Afghanistan a total of eight times. And I can attest to one of those times. Probably, uh, John Spiker, you can probably help me with this. What year did we beat Wake Forest in double overtime? <laughs> 2005? See, I knew Spike would know. I was going to say 06, but he would have corrected me afterwards. So, um, so anyway, after uh, Coach Beeline and, and the Mountaineers had beaten uh, Wake Forest in the NCAA tournament, uh, about 20 or 30 minutes after that, my phone rang at home. And it was an odd number that came up, 000-555-1212. And it was almost midnight. 
I thought, well, I'm not going to answer this, but I did. And it's Dave Taylor on the other end. He was bouncing off the walls, okay? He had an opportunity to watch that game, uh, and he, he said, Vinny, I had to call somebody, so I'm calling you. <laughs> so I tried to bait him a little bit. I said, Taylor, where are you? And he just laughed. He goes, you know I can't tell you that. So, but he was probably in Iraq. But his next venture in the Army was the Joint Special Operations Command Liaison, where he worked at the Pentagon. He was an expert for counterterrorism operations. He briefed senior members of the Department of Defense, and he also briefed uh, congressional and Senate members as well. These operations were regarding homeland security and strategic interests, of which some of these required presidential approval. David's final command with the United States Army was as a commander of the 1st Battalion, 3rd U.S. Infantry Regiment, the Old, the old Guard at Joint Base Meyer Henderson Hall in Virginia, which basically uh, adjoins Arlington National Cemetery. In this command, David would lead over 600 soldiers whose mission was to conduct military funerals, primarily at Arlington, for fallen and retired comrades. David retired from the United States Army in July 2017. He is currently the Director of Leadership with the LDR Investment Group in Washington, D.C. I found a quote by John Keegan. It kind of pers personifies uh, what David Taylor uh, means uh, and what he's accomplished. Soldiers, when committed to a task, cannot compromise. It's unrelenting devotion to the standards of duty and courage, absolute loyalty to others, and not letting the task go until it's been completed. David Taylor is a special person, and he's a true patriot who embodies humility, character, leadership, courage, and bravery through his unbridled service to his flag, his fellow countrymen, and his comrades. He displays the same passion and commitment to West Virginia University through his love for the institution and for the Mountaineers. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my distinct pleasure to present to you David Taylor for induction into the 2018 CPAS Hall of Fame. Kids actually might think I'm cool for at least the rest of the night. <laughs> Good luck. Yeah, exactly. Maybe by the time I'm done, it'll, that, that'll wear off with them. Well, I hope everyone's having a great night. It's always uh, great to be back in uh, Morgantown. I think the last two times I was here, the, the football team lost, so at least there's no game this weekend. Uh, so we can ensure that won't happen. Uh, Dr. Brooks, Mark Gavin, committee members. Fellow Hall of Famers, Mountaineers, and family friends, thanks again for attending tonight's ceremony, and thanks for listening to everybody. Having, as Vinny said, my last assignment in the Old Guard, I must have stood through countless of speeches, of which I don't remember a single one of them. So I'll very much try to keep this to five minutes, but sometimes I can go on a tangent. So if I do, Vinny or Doug, just you know, give me the give me the cue. A special thanks to my parents, uh, Dave and Pat, which are sitting right there, and my amazing kids, Michael and Allison. Uh, for obviously, you guys didn't really have a choice. You were coming tonight one way or the other. <laughs> and Vinny, thanks for the kind words. It uh, really means a lot to me. When I was nominated last year, I thought it was a mistake and not meant for me, uh, quite frankly. I would look at it, uh, I'd look at the packet occasionally and uh, read it and think, no way I'm worthy of this honor. I just served in the Army. It uh, sat on my desk, I think, for about five months or so before I actually decided to do something with it. I graduated from what was in the School of Physical Education and more specifically as part of the athletic training program. I was also a member of WVU Army ROTC and set to get commissioned as a second lieutenant in 1997, continuing a path I started in 1992 when I first enlisted in the Army. 
At the time, I, I didn't realize that I'd end up staying in the Army for 20 years. I always just said I'd take it one year at a time. And I, I kind of figured it was, was going to happen. I think two years after I got my certification in athletic training, you've got to keep CEUs up, continuing education units, and I, I couldn't. And I got this letter. Obviously, it still scars me because I remember it. A whole letter there in big, bold, black letters, your certification revoked. I was like, wow. I'm like, that was kind of harsh. I mean, I was just, I thought I was doing some pretty neat things in the Army. And I, I, as you can tell, I, I still have nightmares over it. Uh, after looking at the letter a few more months, I figured I would write to Kimberly Camming in the dean's office and confirm what I thought was just a mistake. She got back to me shortly after I emailed her and confirmed I was, in fact, eligible for this honor. It was a true surprise when Dr. Brooks called me to inform me that I was chosen for induction into the CPAS Hall of Fame. To me, again, like I said, all I did was just serve in the Army. That led me to the next dilemma I was up against, and what was I going to talk about in my speech? I could not talk about athletic training or academic research. I was also not going to stand in front of a group and tell a bunch of war stories. A bit of a fish out of water, so to speak, is how I felt. So what I talk about? After some thought, I realized that what got me here tonight was not just because I was a graduate of CPAS that went on to serve in the Army for over 20 years. It was because of the people that influenced and shaped me to become the person that helped me successfully lead our nation's most sacred treasure while serving in the military and multiple combat deployments. I felt it'd be appropriate to recognize them because I always told myself if I could ever recognize the people that influenced me, I would do just that. Some are here tonight, some could not make it, but they all deserve the recognition. Because the importance for me, especially those who lead, teach, or coach, which are many of you in this room here tonight as a matter of fact, is that your impact and influence on people are everlasting and provide an enduring life lessons. Each person I talk about have played a pivotal role in my life to this point. Steve Frederick, that's a name uh, my parents actually might be the only ones that remember. He was my neighbor as a kid who would play endless hours of football with me and made me go out in the rain to ensure that I took handoffs in bad weather because you just had to practice what you would play in. My best rushing game ever in high school and the game I broke the single season rushing record was, well, you know it, it was in the rain. I was never ever to tell him the influence he had on me as he passed away at a very young age. Dave Porter, my dad, who's sitting right there, uh, diligently recording me, he, almost like he's a millennial, I like it. <laughs> in, <laughs> in what I consider a pivotal moment, pivotal moment in my life, while well, a freshman going into high school walked me into the high school football trials because frankly I was scared. I was just going to leave and not go that way. I sometimes wonder if we never took that walk into the high school gym, what, path would, what my path would have been. I don't think it would have led me to this moment in time. Jeff Herrick, my high school football coach, took me on his wing and said sometime to me, something to me that I have not forgotten nor will I ever forget. Uh, one day after a football uh, camp, he said to me, Dave, are you injured or are you hurt? Because there's a difference. If you're injured, you need to go see a doctor. If you're hurt, I need you to play. I want you to be the starting running back, but I need to know the difference. It seems trivial, but it's a very good life lesson there. Jim Fontaine, gentleman sitting right here, who introduced me to athletic training when I was a jun in junior college. He was not only the cross country coach, uh, but he was a head athletic trainer. Jim got me into athletic training and became a great friend and inspiration. Whenever I'd come home, I'd always meet up with Jim and often go out on a bike ride and still do so. I try to keep up with him physically, and he'll never say it, but he and his friend last year uh, bicycled across the, the U.S. And how, how many days was it, Jim? 45 days across, across country. I, I think I do some crazy things, but I think that's drastically crazy. This all led to my years as a student in CPAS at WVU. I was fortunate to get accepted in the athletic training program and learn from the staff and professors that helped me not only in the field of athletic training, but more importantly in how to become a professional. Learning how to be a professional was everlasting and translated directly into my military service. I was fortunate to work with the likes of Denise Massey and Tom Colt for an entire year and gained an immense amount of respect for how they approached their profession. Dave Kearns running the beast that is the head is the head athletic football trainer, head athletic trainer for football. And John Spiker sitting uh, back here, who may or may not remember, we had a fairly one-way conversation in the uh, <laughs> in the football athletic training room. And by one-way conversation, it wasn't me to John; it was it was John to me. <laughs> I learned from it, and that's the that's the important thing. Randy, who's uh, over at basketball uh, coliseum right now, who I'm not sure ages because he looks the same, has become a lasting friend and followed me throughout my career. 
and visited me uh, as a commander while serving down in Arlington National Cemetery. Colonel retired Doug Floor, who's sitting uh, right here. Go ahead. It's amazing I have not called you sir yet, which is, you can tell I've now been a, a civilian for a year. <laughs> he was my professor of military science here in ROTC. I was working, uh, working out one day at Gold's Gym that used to be here before they got the, the fancy system down here, and uh, basically recruited me into the ROTC program while I was working out. And he was one of the first of very many uh, influential leaders in my military career. At one point he said, I would rather take a leader who's walking somewhere and sees a piece of trash and bends over and picks it up than a leader who just walks over that piece of trash. He goes on to say, it says a lot about someone's character. I can't count how many times I thought of that as I debated stepping over a piece of trash over the last 25 years or whatever it's been. However, the most important thing he ever did for me was introduce me to Krispy Kreme donuts. <laughs> I spent many a NASCAR races going to did Krispy Kreme donuts before there. Uh, coincidentally, Peggy Bonson is here somewhere. Where is, where is Peggy? So Peggy did not know she was going to be here, but at the time she ran the ROTC program when I was here, and I have not seen her since I, uh, I got commissioned. So kind of kind of neat having her here tonight. It's great to see you again. All right, now, of course, I lost my, I lost my spot. All right, uh, Major General Carrilla, who cannot be here, he's in uh, Qatar, played an instrumental role in my life and career the last seven years. I'll never forget what he did for me, and I'll always try to pay it forward. And of course, there's Vince, whom, like Randy, I've stayed in touch with uh, plenty, and he has plenty of stories on me. I appreciate you, Vinny, for not uh, exposing me to my kids over those times. <laughs> I, I did also call Vinny in Baghdad in 2000, when I was in Baghdad in 2003, and I just told my mother that not too long ago, and she was not happy to find out I called Vinny and not her. And I appreciate you also talking about me calling you after the basketball game and not, and not my mom. Uh, it was a true honor to have Vinny uh, both as a professor and a friend over the years. It's truly been awesome, Vinny, and I'm happy for your retirement and getting back to your home state there and, and watching your beloved Cardinals play. It goes without saying that the early foundation for me was set by my mom and dad, and I think you guys did a pretty darn good job. Mom, maybe I'll take you to the sports page. So anybody, the sports page is a bar, if you don't know it, down here in town on High Street. Well, for years, my mom thought those school supplies came from the sports page. <laughs> so maybe I drove the kids by the sports page this morning. Maybe I'll show you where the, those credit card bills came from. <laughs> Thank you for being the parents that you are. My, my two kids, Mike and Allison, often everyone thinks about the deployed service member. Uh, why they're gone, but they often forget uh, about the families. And those eight deployments, my two kids right there also endured it. Uh, and in my life, the two most proud things are I am are of those two right there. You guys make me more proud than anything, and I know I tell you that all the time, but I'll, I'll tell you again, uh, that's, that's the most important thing to me are you two right there. Thanks for being awesome. And remember, I'm cool for the rest of the night, okay? <laughs> See, in the end, uh, to me, I wanted this to be about the people that influenced me to get me here today, the people that molded my thoughts and ideas to create the man I am today. No matter what accomplishment I may have achieved throughout my life or my military career, it was because someone at some point took the time to influence me in a positive manner. It was as if I was being passed from one influencer to another as a kid and a teenager to the time I got here in CPAS and WVU, where I was not just surrounded by a major or curriculum or an ROTC program, but I was surrounded by people and the culture that taught me so much at an early age of adulthood and never left. Without the people making a difference here at WVU and setting the foundations of professionalism and standards, I'm not sure that I'd be standing here today. And it, this is the most important part. Everybody's probably forgotten anything, but this is what I want everyone who I've talked to uh, and mentioned here tonight. While I veered away from what I majored in, what you all taught me about life, responsibility, and taking care of others was far more valuable than any degree a certification. And the reason that is, is everything you guys taught me and taught me, teach me, show me how to be a professional, I took that to the military. So not only did you guys influence me, you influenced hundreds and hundreds of soldiers over the last 20 years. And to me, that's the most important thing than any degree or certification could ever provide. Thank you guys very much for all that. Sweet, I'm not even done yet. I am about done. This is such an incredible honor, and I'm so proud to be a Mountaineer. The school carried me past my graduation and through numerous deployments, as the flying WV went with me on every deployment I went to. The pride in being a Mountaineer can't be surpassed by any university. WVU was not just a school to attend, 
but it became, and to this day, remains a part of my identity, and I've always wanted to represent it well. Thank you for bestowing this incredible honor on me, and this is not the end, it's just the beginning. Thank you again, everyone. Have a great night, and let's go Mountaineers. Dr. Debbie Thorpe is our third inductee. She's a graduate of West Virginia University, receiving both her undergraduate degree in elementary education and her master's degree in early childhood motor development and motor learning. She earned her BS degree in physical therapy at the University of New England. In 1993, Debbie became a pediatric certified specialist awarded by the American Board of Physical Therapy Examiners. Dr. Thorpe earned her PhD in pediatric physical therapy at the Medical College of Pennsylvania and Hanneman University. She is presently an associate professor in the Center for Development and Learning at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Debbie's previous educational experiences include teaching science and math at North Elementary School for six years in Morgantown. She was the Director of Physical Therapy at the Sullivan Diagnostic Treatment Center in Monticello, New York. In addition, Dr. Thorpe was an Assistant Professor within the School of Allied Health Sciences at the University of Texas Medical Branch. Dr. Thorpe has written over 24 articles relating to physical therapy, physical activity and disease, role of weight status and exercise, and other topics too numerous to mention this evening. Furthermore, Debbie has written 35 abstracts and has made over 21 presentations. She is presently a reviewer for the manuscripts in the Journal of Pediatric Rehabilitation Medicine, the Journal of Sport Rehabilitation, and Developmental Medicine and Child Neurology. Debbie has also served a three-year term on CPAS's visiting committee. Introducing Dr. Debbie Thorpe this evening is Dr. Linda Carson. Hi, everybody. Uh, first of all, I want to uh, really congratulate the committee um, uh, who made all of the selections tonight and who put this event on. I think they're to be commended. Uh, this is always a very, very special evening. And I want to congratulate all the inductees this is a fabulous evening, learning about everybody's uh, career paths and their contributions that they've made over their careers. So well done, everybody. I'm really honored to introduce uh, Professor Thorpe to you this evening. But it's been really difficult to pare down my comments in uh, memories to fit in this very short allotted amount of time. I'm going to try. Um, Mark Twain said, uh, it was something like this, not word for word, but something like this. Mark Twain said, if you want me to speak for an hour, I can step up and do that for you today. But if you want me to speak for just a few minutes, I'll need several weeks to prepare for that. Yeah. And that's kind of how I felt about this. <laughs> There's so many memories and so many things I would like to say. and. Um, I just can't fit it into this amount of time. Uh, Dr. Thorpe's bio in the program uh, is just a brief summary of an exemplary career. And as you read those many milestones, uh, you'll see why she's deserving of being recognized this evening. So her bio speaks for itself. I, I've known Debbie for what seems like a lifetime. Um, 
And after all, we met in the youth of our professional journeys. I was just starting here and just starting to conceptualize these learning labs uh, for WVU students that would include parents uh, with their preschool children to come to campus. And as a grad student, Debbie was really instrumental in uh, brainstorming some of these unusual but oddly appropriate learning experiences for the gym and the pool uh, in those very early days of those motor development labs. We came up with all kinds of concoctions. Um, Debbie's friends in college nicknamed her neat and tidy. <laughs> Precise and organized and uncluttered. Imagine uh, earning that nickname in the dorm. Uh, but I think neat and tidy is a great metaphor for the way you've approached your career. Um, focused and orderly, persistent and well-planned and executed. Dr. Thorpe started her career teaching at North Elementary, uh, right here in Morgantown. Um, North was brand new at the time and designed to be exceptional and forward-thinking, innovative. And so what a great place to start your professional uh, journey that, as you can read in her bio, continued to demonstrate innovation and standard of excellence the whole way through. Professor Thorpe is held in very high regard nationally and internationally for her work and her research at UNC Chapel Hill. But WVU and CPASS uh, really helped to provide that substantial preparation foundation that she um, very successfully continued to build on. And her journey has not been focused just on um, research and uh, administrivia and academics. Uh, she balances that with faith and family and friends. There are many stories, and uh, we just can't go there. <laughs> and I still laugh when I think of them. Uh, unlike Debbie, I, I was always organi organizationally challenged. So we differed along those lines, but over the years we've shared a lot of similar aspirations and visionary hopes for children and families. So it's incredibly special for a grad student to not only stay connected over the years, which I've been grateful for, but Debbie has done even more than that. She's included me uh, in her career uh, path uh, by including me on her doctoral committee in Philadelphia, inviting me to speak when she was on faculty in Texas, brought me down for an event down there. Um, she uh, had me uh, be included as guest faculty at UNC Chapel Hill one summer, which was wonderful. Uh, we tried to do some collaborative projects. Remember when we tried to build a, a, a walker outside of the Coliseum and we wanted your CP uh, kids to be able to rollerblade behind it? Um, that never got out of the building stage, but we had a great time doing collaborative projects. And then I was so pleased that it kind of came full circle uh, whenever uh, Debbie generously contributed her time right back again at CPAS on the visiting committee. So uh, just wonderful um, um, experiential wisdom that she could bring back to administrators and faculty and staff and students right here at WVU. My life has been blessed because of hers and I thank you for that Debbie. Um, she's had a long and distinguished career, certainly deserving of the recognition by WVU and CPAS this evening. 
A life of significance is about serving those who need your gifts and serving those who need your leadership and those who need your purpose. It takes a really long time before you can call somebody an old friend. And I think we've surpassed those milestones. I'm privileged and really honored tonight to introduce you to Professor Debbie Thorpe, my old friend, and have her be inducted into the CPAS Hall of Fame. Debbie. Wow, it's um, quite an honor to be here. I want to congratulate as well all the inductees tonight. Um, I want to thank Dean Brooks, the visiting committee, and WVU CPAS for this distinguished honor. I want to especially thank Dr. Carson for her over-the-top introduction, her mentorship, and her friendship as an old friend. I would like to acknowledge my family and friends who are here to celebrate with me tonight. My wife, Judy, my daughter, Skylar, my sister, Tammy, and her boyfriend, Ramey, and my dear friend of 40 years, PJ Bell. Without all of their support throughout my life, this would not have been possible. My professional journey started here at WVU and has now come full circle. The journey began 44 years ago when I decided to turn down a scholarship at Pitt and enroll at WVU. <laughs> As a 17-year-old freshman at WVU, and knowing no one, I was introduced to CPAS almost immediately as a student athlete. I was a member of the volleyball team, followed my freshman year, and went on to play four years of volleyball and softball for Veronica Hammersmith. In my sophomore year, I received a scholarship and was part of the first wave of scholarships to be awarded to female athletes in the United States. Being a member of a collegiate team at WVU helped to develop my work ethic and character and drive to succeed and remains with me to this day. I can't tell you what it meant for me to be able to walk into the Coliseum this afternoon with my daughter and show her where I played as one of the earliest female student athletes at WVU. We had to have special permission to get in because it was all locked up. <laughs> But the ticket man let us in, so we got some pictures. As I tell her often when she asks me to do age-appropriate physical feats, I am OLD. After undergraduate and with a degree in elementary education, I accepted a teaching position teaching sixth grade at North Elementary here in Morgantown. I was fortunate to be mentored by one of the county's most creative and innovative educators, P.J. Bell. P.J. retired several years ago after teaching 40 plus years in the Montegalli County school system. I know for a fact that half of Morgantown's population was educated by P.J. Bell. I am sure she will tell you I was not the easiest mentee, but thank goodness she did not give up on me. P.J. encouraged my enthusiasm while tempering my grandiose ideas. We became a teaching team to be reckoned with. She's been a staunch supporter throughout all of my academic adventures. She encouraged me to do my master's at CPAS and encouraged me to leave teaching to pursue a physical therapy degree. And she also encouraged me to enthusiastically pursue my PhD. I'm so thrilled that she can be here to celebrate with me today. During graduate school at CPAS, I participated as a graduate assistant in the nationally recognized kinder skills program developed by Dr. Linda Carson. Through Kinder Skills, I interacted with children with disabilities that were mainstreamed into this innovative physical activity program. Dr. Carson's philosophy on the education and instruction of young children and her passion to strive to ensure that every child be provided opportunity for physical activity in their learning environment fueled my desire to become a pediatric physical therapist. 
Dr. Carson was not only the CPAS mentor for my master's degree, but she was also an instrumental mentor and a part of my dissertation committee, as she mentioned, in pediatric physical therapy. Finally, my relationship with CPAS came full circle several years when Dean Brooks asked me to serve on the CPAS visiting committee. I was honored to be able to give back to the institution that nurtured me, providing to me the knowledge, the professionalism, and not least of all the pride, Mountaineer pride, to pay it forward through mentorship of the next generation of educators, clinicians, and researchers. Several weeks ago, I contacted WCVUC passes at welcoming today as it was 44 years ago. Several years ago, I contacted Dean Brooks about a patient of mine, a young adult with cerebral palsy who wanted to potentially explore graduate work in sports administration and sports management. Dean Brooks put Dr. Bravo in contact with him, and last weekend he and his family traveled to WVU, and Dr. Bravo spent two hours with he and his family talking and engaging this young man about a future in sports management. I am proud to be a West Virginia University Mountaineer and truly appreciate the influence of the WVC Pass on my life, both personally and professionally. Thank you again to everyone for this great honor. Our fourth inductee is Rick Tusi, who earned his undergraduate and graduate degrees in physical education from West Virginia University. He taught physical education biology for 39 years in Dade County Public Schools in Miami, Florida. He was also the head wrestling coach for 10 years at Miami Dade Junior College, having earned an impressive record of 106 wins and four losses. <clears throat> At the conclusion of his coaching career, the next step for Rick was to immerse himself in the sport of wrestling by becoming an outstanding official. As an official, he has represented the United States in eight Olympic Games, beginning in 1984 in Los Angeles and ending with the London Games in 2012. Rick has also officiated in 75 World Championships and hundreds of tournaments around the country and the world. In his years of advocacy for good sportsmanship, integrity, and dignity among competitors and officials, Rick has been recognized as the outstanding referee at the World Championships. He was awarded the National Wrestling Hall of Fame Lifetime Achievement Award for officials and he was presented the Gold Whistle Award for the Outstanding Official in the Olympic Games. In 2001, Rick was honored by the National Wrestling Hall of Fame as the distinguished member. He is only one of two officials to ever receive this award. In 2012, Rick was Wrestling USA Magazine Official of the Year. He has been president of United States Wrestling since 1988, which is an organization that consists of 2,600 members. In 2016, the United States Wrestling Officials Association presented him with their Lifetime Achievement Award. Introducing Rick Tusi this evening is Dominic and Nicholas Tusi. This may be a little repetitive, so bear with me. Um, so my father has accomplished a lot throughout his lifetime. Uh, he's worked 30 plus world championships along with eight Olympic games, has been inducted into the National and International Wrestling Halls of Fame, National High School Hall of Fames, the Florida Sports Hall of Fame, and was awarded the gold whistle, as mentioned, at the Seoul Olympics. Uh, I list many of these accolades, not just because of how impressive many of these are, but because you'll never hear him speak on them. We grew up realizing, we grew up not realizing 
how large of an impact my father has made on the sport. Uh, when you first walk into our house, the first things you see are a clay model my brother made in elementary school, um, a few medals my mom has won throughout marathons and trophies through different sports that we grew up playing. Um, a lot of his trophies and rings that he's won are primarily locked up in the, uh, in the attic. So um, it wasn't until our first trip to the World Championship in New York when we were able to realize how big of an impact he's made on the sport. Uh, just talking to different athletes, coaches, and even other referees about how truly impactful he has been on the wrestling, uh, both nationally and even internationally. Uh, my brother and I know him uh, as a man who coached our baseball teams, was our biggest fans during volleyball and football games throughout high school, and even a man who took cross-country uh, red-eye flights just to be there on time for our games. And even, of course, the man who routinely drilled the lyrics of John Denver, Country Roads Take Me Home, <laughs> into our heads every game day. Uh, so while he isn't being inducted into the Hall of Fame for his many accomplishments to the sport of wrestling, uh, he is deserving of this in uh, this, this induction simply because of the caliber of father he is. He is the man and the father we aspire to be each and every day. Dad, we're so proud of you and congratulations. Thank you. Wow, he's never said that, those nice things about me before. <laughs> we ought to do this more often. Uh, I would like to thank Dr. Brooks, the College of Physical Activity and Sports Science for this prestigious award. I would also like to thank the other award winners tonight as well-deserved honors after listening to their resumes. I'm wondering, why am I in this group? I mean, these are all prestigious doctors, serve their countries. I mean, it's, it's amazing. Um, I earned a, a BS, a Bachelor of Science, Master of Science in Biology and PE in uh, the mid-60s. I came here as an 18-year-old freshman from New Jersey because I wanted to come to West Virginia. I read up on some schools. I had some different opportunities, but West Virginia seemed to be the right fit. I'd never been here before. I came here, and I was telling my family earlier that my first roommate, we were just driving along High Street, and I was looking for a place to stay, and he was looking for a place to stay. He says, hey, I got a place. We need another guy. I said, okay. I mean, I'm thinking, world today probably wouldn't do that, but did it back then. Um, back when I started at West Virginia, I, I always knew I wanted to be a, a PE teacher. Coach, I wasn't so sure of, but I came because I wanted to wrestle. My faculty advisor was John Seaman, who was in the CPAC Hall of, uh, Hall of Fame. Dr. Wincy Ann Carruth was the uh, department chair, and uh, one of my closest teachers was Bill Bonsell, who I went over to the Hall of Fame and I, I really, I, I looked up Bill Bonsell and I didn't realize he was actually in Normandy on D-Day, got captured and escaped from the Germans. And I never knew that and he never said anything and it was just amazing to me. Um, I would like to recognize some people that are here tonight for me. Uh, I have Danny and Cheryl Zottarelli, who I wrestled with at West Virginia. Bill and Sue Steckline, who Bill has been through four Olympic Games with me. My wife, Sina, Dominic and Nick, you met, you met already. Um, we, to, to get to where I was, uh, my, my mentor was Coach Steve Herrick. Some of you remember him, some of you wouldn't. He was a coach many years ago in wrestling. He was probably the last dinosaur coach that would coach wrestling and baseball. 
And I, I wrestled varsity for three years, and then I, I had two surgeries on my knees, and it wasn't orthoscopic then, it was the old zipper surgeries. And uh, he made me his undergraduate assistant, and I became a graduate assistant. And during when I was a graduate, he came in to practice wearing his baseball uniform. And, you know, he started practice, and he used to call me Ricky. He said, well, Ricky, I got to go to the baseball field. Take it over. I'm thinking, I've never run practice before. I, I assisted him, and I helped him, but he had the confidence in me for me to take the practice and to get started, to take these athletes who were probably better than I was as far as wrestling was concerned, to, to get ready for whatever meets or tournaments we were gonna get into. Um, I had my ups and downs, but the, the, the faculty at West Virginia, between John Seaman and, and Steve Herrick and Dr. Carruth always told me, hey, you may have got knocked down, Maybe you didn't do good in this class, but you come back, you get up stronger. Between wrestling and the atmosphere here at the university helped me become where I am today. My first refereeing position, or my first refereeing school, was I was a senior, and the referee from a Morgantown High School match was sick, and they contacted Coach Herrick, and he said, you go referee, I had to borrow a whistle, uniform and went out and refereed. They didn't yell at me, so I guess I did okay. <laughs> so from there, you know, I, I, I gained the confidence to continue with refereeing through high school, through college, and then on the international level. I got my international license in 1973, and as you heard from my son, uh, it's been a long journey. Uh, eight Olympic Games, they, he didn't mention the Moscow. That's when we boycotted, and I did boycott Mo Moscow because that's what the president wanted, and that's what we did. But uh, I, 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 I believe where I am today is because of the education and the foundation I got here at West Virginia University. I can never thank people enough for the job that they did in molding me into the person that I am. I retired a few years ago from teaching, but I'm still involved with officiating, not so much on the international mat, but I do evaluations now. I am still refereeing high school down in Dade and Broward County in Florida, so I'm still involved as long as I can keep moving and I don't cause anybody to get hurt or to lose because of what I have done wrong. Um, in that, 2016, I was invited to the Rio Olympics, and I went into the uh, International Wrestling Olympic Hall of Fame. And what I really was floored at was that all the officials from the Olympic Games were there in attendance at this banquet, and they gave me a an ovation that it just sent shivers down my spines because a lot of them I, I started, I mentored, I criticized, I praised, but I always tried to make them a better official and a fair official uh, as, they, as they continue their, uh, their life as a, as a referee. And many of these guys, their whole lives was refereeing. Um, in conclusion, I'd just like to thank Dr. Brooks, everybody, for this honor, and my wife, Sina, and my boys for putting up with all the traveling I've done over the years. And hey, they lost last week, but they could still finish the rest of the season undefeated. Oh, wow. Go Mountaineers! This evening, we have listened to our four inductees speak of their memories, their challenges, and inspirations within their professional journeys. 
the Ward's Hall of Fame will now be added to their list of accolades. The Hall of Fame committee is proud of you. We congratulate you and we have honored you tonight. Thank you very much. Isn't that great? One more. Come on. Yay. Peggy Boston, please come forward, please. And I'd like to congratulate all of the uh, inductees into the Hall of Fame. Uh, you make us very proud. Um, my job tonight is very brief, um, and I need to make an introduction. But first, I want to tell you that uh, there is an outstanding uh, alumnus alumna uh, committee. And although you don't ever see us, we do a job. And John Spiker is here. He is one of the, the members. The others are not here. They are Judith Hayes, Bill Douglas, uh, Jack Front, and uh, John Spiker, as I said, and, and myself. And uh, our job is to, from among the many wonderful, really talented people uh, that have graduated from uh, the School of CPAS now um, and have been inducted into the Hall of Fame, uh, we are challenged with finding an outstanding uh, alumnus or alumna. And it is quite a challenge, believe me. With, As you can see, with the talent that is here in the room, uh, that should be uh, patently obvious to you. Anyway, I'm not going to, uh, I'll tell you who he is. Um, <laughs> and just a little aside note, um, I at one time had to introduce him before. He has the hardest name I've ever tried to introduce. <laughs> and his name is uh, Dr. Zewantowski. Am I close? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, okay, Dr. Zewantowski. And to tell you about our outstanding uh, alumnus is uh, Associate Interim uh, Dean, and that is Jack Watson. Jack? So I too would like to congratulate all of the recipients this evening. Uh, your accomplishments are amazing and just humble me and make me so proud to be a Mountaineer and a faculty member at CPAS. Um, I just hope that we can continue. There is a fly that keeps flying in my face. Um, but I hope that we can continue to turn out alumni just like you because you guys have represented our college so, so amazingly. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. David Jeveltowski uh, for as the recipient of the Outstanding Alumnus Award for CPAS this year. Uh, I was not actually supposed to be the individual introducing him. Dr. Andy Ostro was, and unfortunately he was unable to be here. But when I talked to Andy and asked him, what would you like me to say about David? He said, I have two stories I'd like you to tell. Those of you that know Andy might think that these are good or bad stories. Um, first, he said that I think in the summer between your first and second year in your master's program, uh, you're shaking your head. You already know the story that I'm going to tell. Uh, Andy was, um, was awarded a visiting professorship at the University of Oregon. And so he packed his two kids and his wife uh, up in the car, and they drove cross country to Oregon. Um, the one part of the family that they did not pack up in the car was the family dog. And uh, apparently, uh, David agreed to dog sit for two, two and a half months for their dog. Uh, Andy said that they had the nice drive back. They got back to the house, and at that point, he had to put his dog in therapy for two to, th <laughs> two to three months. Um, but on a more serious note, what, what Andy also said was that uh, Andy taught at WVU until probably about 2008. 
Um, and throughout that time, he always taught our, our thesis and dissertation seminar, which is preparing students who, who are finishing their degree to write an enormous manuscript. Um, throughout that time, uh, he used pretty much up until the end David's thesis as the sample for uh, all the documents that he wanted students to write. So for many, many years after David had graduated, the quality of his document was so good that it was probably read by more students at WVU than any other thesis. Uh, so uh, to give you a brief introduction of, of, of David, uh, Dr. Jeveltowski is an accomplished population uh, health social scientist and higher education administrator. His research developed uh, health behavior theory and identified strategies that build the capacity of adults and youth to influence the conditions of community places in which they live, learn, and play to promote physical activity and healthful eating. His healthy place development strategies have been tested in childcare, schools, after school programs, youth sport, and diverse community organizations. He coined the term community wellness landscape, which is a mosaic of diverse places across a community, providing physical activity opportunities for children and families. His laboratory has had over $10 million of support from several health foundations, the USDA, and the National Institutes of Health. His funding has resulted in over 100 publications and 8,000 citations in scientific literature. He served in the US and internationally on review boards, including the Kansas Governor's Council for Fitness, Exercise, and Sports Science Reviews, NIH, the United Kingdom Medical Research Council, and the National Academy of Sciences. At, the, at Kansas State University, Dr. Jeveltowski was a successful administrator leading organizational improvement in higher education as the head of the Department of Kinesiology and the director of the Community Health Institute for over 20 years. Currently, he is the Endowed Community Chair for Activity, Nutrition, and Obesity at the University of Nebraska Medical Center and the Buffett Early Childhood Institute. He is a fellow of the National Academy of Kinesiology. It's my pleasure to introduce or to, to present Dr. Jeveltowski. Present this, the Homer Office. That's David. <laughs> I think officials. Okay. Right. Well, this is fun. Uh, uh, to the faculty who are still here, I've had to sit through a lot of awards banquets over the years, so thank you. But also thank you for everyone who's contributed to being at this event. It's a, a great event, and, and in fact, I thought I'd start with just how I got here. So picture early 1980s. This kid out in the Northwest, actually grew up in Seattle, went to Western Western University, was a distance runner, cross country track. And, and I'm sitting there trying to figure out what to do with my life. I was a psychology major. And I thought, well, hey, I'll just go to grad school. So I applied to several grad schools, and, and West Virginia University offered me a research assistantship. And I got on a plane, two suitcases, everything I owned, flew in to Pittsburgh, took a bus down to Morgantown, and said, oh my god, this is a different place. <laughs> Uh, it was hard because I, you know, my life revolved around running and athletics, and now it was revolved around ac academics and, and, and athletics. But there were several individuals that really affected me. First, I'd like to talk about Dr. Andy Ostro. So Andy was my mentor, my major professor, but you know, he was also somebody who, it was beyond the classroom. He did tell the story how I house sit all summer, and he didn't mention, well, I watched this dog, he gave me free rent for two and a half months. Um, and, and he also didn't mention that, you know, we were trying to decide after my master's what was the best next step. And I really wanted to emphasize health and physical activity, and at that time, physical activity was a major risk factor for 
heart disease yet. It wasn't, there was no Surgeon General's report. But we found a place at Iowa where I could go get a PhD and kind of create a health psychology exercise psych PhD degree. Um, the part of the story that ne Andy never tells is I, I rented a car, actually I rented a, a wagon uh, from a renter car place up in Pittsburgh to get all my stuff out of his house <laughs> and drive to Iowa City where, where I started my PhD program. And they wouldn't rent me the car. And to this day, I still remember, and he may not, that he actually used his credit card as a professor to allow them to rent that car to get me to Iowa City. Um, so I got my PhD at Iowa, met my wife who's here, thank you Kathy. We went down to Manhattan, Kansas, where I became a, a professor at K-State. Thought I'd be there one year, I was there 29. Uh, raised two wonderful children, uh, had a good time there. Um, and uh, was very excited when West Virginia joined the Big 12 because then I could, uh, could watch and also had someone else to root for against Kansas. Um, so that was nice. Um, although I, I would not want that plane flight. Um, but uh, um, yeah, so it was a good time. Um, and recently my kids grew up, uh, Chelsea's doing very well, my son actually graduated mechanical engineering and is starting a PhD program in our field in biomechanics, uh, which was a big surprise this summer. Um, and I, I, I got offered a position up at the University of Nebraska Medical Center uh, to really be a scientist again. I was an administrator. I wanted to avoid being a provost or a dean, and, and, and they let me be a full-time scientist up there. But the interesting part of that story was it was a unique endowed chair position that combined health science with education. So I, I'm, a, I'm a appointed in the College of Public Health, but also in the Buffett Early Childhood Institute. The interesting part of this story is uh, one of the themes of that institute in this position is to eliminate inequities in young children, both academically and health inequities. And so I go back and I think, well, you know, where in my career did I start looking at achievement? I wrote a paper, I think it was in Bill Alsop's class, and, and I used the same paper in, Danny, in Dana's class both. Really? I think. <laughs> really looking at social mobility through sport. And it's just amazing that here I am years ago looking at this graduate school class looking at social mobility through sport and now we're, we're addressing you know, physical activity in sport as a way to decrease health and educational disparities in young children. The, the, the other part of that is during my education here, uh, you know, I, I actually had Linda Carson's grad class in motor development and was out doing little motor development games with an intergenerational program with older adults and preschool kids. I think it was the first year you did the grandparents and the young young kids program, which is really funny because now I'm in, I have an appointment in the Buffett Early Childhood Institute whose focuses on zero to eight and I'm around all these early childhood educators again. Um, and then uh, Andy at that time was really focused on lifespan development. So um, I'm actually combining many of the things I learned here. And that base is amazing because I still pull out, I think, Linda, did you do a beanbag uh, dissertation around uh, a schema theory? Yeah, yes, OK. I still pull out that stuff now, Dave, a great academic base that, that, that served me well. Um, so getting this report is timely. I wish it was like five years later because we're just embarking on a new five-year study funded by the National Cancer Institute looking at cancer prevention through physical activity. Physical activity is a primary risk factor for 13 different cancers right now and we're doing a rural community trial where we're randomizing communities to different strategies to promote physical activity across the community for young children recognizing that we need to get young children involved in physical activity to stem uh, the uh, risk for cancer later than life. So West Virginia got me to this point. It was a key point in my life course, and I just want to thank everybody here and thank for you for this award.
Dr. Hawkins, please come forward. A little different. Service award. To profession, to CPAS. A mentor, role model, a religious man. Religion is Andy's name, but help her back. And I came here together 31 years ago. You know that? Yes, from Morgan State, from Towson. He played ball at, at, at Towson. New ball. Yes. Do me a favor. The NBA. The Noontime Basketball Association. Same thing. Yeah. Same thing. Yeah. Do me a favor. For the students and faculty who work with Andy Hawkins, please stand up. The faculty students. Talk about impact. Impact. Look around, folks. Look around. Mm -hmm. That's service. Give me back. <laughs> Where is that you for Andy? Scholar. Mentor, role model, and leader. Please accept Andy Hawkins, Distinguished Service Award President. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you, buddy. Thank you. Jeff, right here. Yeah. Can you that? All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dana. I, I am uh, deeply humbled to be able to uh, accept an award like this. First of all, it's, it's humbling uh, to accept it from Dana Brooks. Uh, as Dana mentioned, uh, we started together, really. Uh, we were colleagues initially. And uh, I think all of you who have had some connection with the College of Physical Activity and Sports Sciences uh, simply have to recognize the extraordinary, visionary leadership of Dana Brooks over many years as dean of this college. It is simply above and beyond anything that I've ever seen in our profession. I honestly mean that. Thank you. And he has the hair to prove it. That's exactly yeah, right. You. That's right. Um, it's, it's humbling in a number of other respects as well. Uh, I simply want to add my congratulations to the, uh, to the inductees, to the Hall of Fame inductees, as well as to David. Uh, it's humbling because uh, most of these people uh, have crossed my path in one form or another over the years, and it's deeply humbling to see what they have accomplished in extraordinary ways. I still have Tracy Schneidel's uh, thesis on a shelf in my study in Fort Myers, along with about 30 other theses and dissertations uh, that I have advised over the years. Yeah, you did base it off of Dave's probably. I, I'm certain of that, and uh, it's just simply humbling to see uh, what has unfolded. We have uh, not only a college, but the program with which I've been associated with physical education, teacher education, uh, has a great history of, uh, of professional service. Um, I can tell you that the nature of the service that, uh, that Linda Carson engaged in over many years is nothing short of astonishing. She has set uh, such an extraordinary mark in that area. Uh, she's not the only person in our faculty to have uh, made a mark in our profession on, and uh, nationally as well. Uh, things that Lynn Hausner has done, uh, things that other of our, my uh, colleagues and faculty members have done uh, are the exemplary uh, exa examples of uh, professional service. And quite honestly, I don't count myself among those people. They are extraordinary uh, professional servants, and so it's deeply humbling to receive an award like this. Uh, I'm also deeply appreciative of some of the relationships with faculty members that I've enjoyed over the years. Uh, my relationship with uh, Bob Wigand uh, is perhaps um, uh, noteworthy uh, over many years. Many of you know that how close that we have been professionally. Even before I arrived here, uh, Bob and I have shared uh, much in the way of professional activities together. Um, and uh, certainly there have been others as well who have have participated in that. Uh, my wife, Jean, and I are deeply grateful for Carl Bonneman, who's no longer with us, as well as his wife, Marie, who uh, were very, very kind to us when we first came uh, to Morgantown. And there's so many of you in this room, I can't even begin to uh, express my appreciation to so many of you who made a 30-some year career 
uh, a real delight and joy. And I know it's not always that way in higher education, and there are often uh, egos involved, but uh, I can tell you that those uh, 32 years that I was here have been an extraordinary pleasure to work uh, with uh, so many of you in one capacity or another. It's uh, deeply humbling uh, to have participated in that. Uh, we are here with a bunch of our friends who have known us for many years, uh, not only in the context of the university, but also in the context of the, the community that we were involved in, in the Christian and Missionary Alliance Church over a number of years, and I'm deeply grateful and thankful for their friendship and love and support over many years, and especially thankful for my wife, Jean, who uh, was willing to uh, basically respond in a great adjustment over a, with a guy who had really his feet in a number of different worlds and uh, was often uh, away from home uh, doing different things, but uh, her support and encouragement and, uh, and, and delight in the world in which we lived, uh, which was extraordinary uh, for me, and I'm deeply humbled by, by all of that as well. Uh, obviously, as Dana mentioned, it's no secret that uh, uh, I've been involved in ministry. I'm in ministry now in Fort Myers. Uh, at a wonderful church down there, but it's also no secret that I was involved in a ministry while I was at WVU for about two-thirds of that time as pastor of adult ministries of a local church here. And uh, I'm certainly very much aware that uh, there is a, a hard line that is drawn between uh, a state institution like WVU and the church, and I uh, am I'm very much in agreement with that line. It's always been difficult when it's been crossed, and not good for either the church or the state when that line has been crossed, and I very much understand and have uh, recognized that line. But I can tell you personally, that uh, for me personally, that line doesn't exist. And by that I mean that uh, the scripture tells me that whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. And so I have recognized over the course of my career that whether I was teaching a class at the university or teaching a class at the church, my overriding desire was to do it in a way that honored the Lord Jesus Christ. And whether I was leading a meeting at the church or overseeing a faculty meeting of some kind, a graduate council meeting, my desire has always been, my aspiration at least, has been to do it for the glory of God. Because whatever I've contributed in terms of any value to this university or to the profession has been to use gifts that God has given to me and the dispositions and energies that he's given to me. And so simply, I am honored uh, for this, uh, to receive this award, uh, but my uh, sole desire is that God would receive the glory. Thank you so much.